meron? Ano nga ba ang meron? Paano nga bang mabuhay ng tapat sa meron? Don't you wish you can relive your philo classes? The terror teachers? The terrible oral exams? Or the even terrifying but liberating and life-changing aha moments? Lundagin mo, baby! Here's your chance! Lundagin mo, baby! Kasama ang mga pilosopong sina Jovi Miroy at Ron Kapinding. Lundagin mo, baby! Leaping upward, leaping forward. Lundagin mo, baby! Leaping to greater heights, to greater wisdom, to greater magis. Lundag na! It's me again, Dr. Jovi Miroy, at uh, Lundagin Mo Baby, all right? And uh, we're here for the third episode uh, of our Philosophy 11 plenary content on the emotions. So the first episode was in was on Aristotle, and we had uh, Mr. Eddie Boy Calasans, and then last week we had... Rene Descartes on the passions, and we had Dr. John Boulang. This week, we have a little known philosopher known as Baruch Spinoza. He's Dutch, all right? He's uh, from uh, Amsterdam, and uh, we'll talk more about him later. He's also a modern philosopher, and he wrote on the emotions. And uh, before we go to the PowerPoint that was prepared by Lucian Jimenez, uh, I would like to greet our Dean, Jonathan Chua. A happy, happy birthday. May I have many more birthdays to come. So here to uh, present to us a PowerPoint presentation on the emotions, the ethical life, the active emotions in Baruch Espinoza, is Lucian Jimenez, one of our young, uh, upcoming uh, philosophy teachers. Take it away, Lucian. Murakami once wrote, is like a small sandstorm that keeps changing directions. You change direction, but the sandstorm chases you. You turn again, but the storm adjusts. Over and over you play this out, like some ominous dance with death just before dawn. Why? Because this storm isn't something that blew in from far away. Something that has nothing to do with you. This storm is you. Something inside of you. This passage was taken from Murakami's Kafka on the Shore and is arguably one of the most frequently quoted sections of the novel. Of interest is the chaotic imagery of a storm, originally thought to be an external force, but eventually revealed to be an internal phenomenon. This storm, whatever it is, is more inescapable than one initially thought. This prompts the reader to ask, where are our own metaphysical storms? Is it external? And if it is, how do we run from it? Or what happens if Murakami was right and this storm is within us? And if it is within us, what can we do about it? There are many interpretations of Kafka on the shore that go beyond this passage alone. But for the purpose of this podcast, let us focus on the idea of causality. Wherever you are, you are a witness to chains of causality in nature. All around you, causal laws interact unceasingly, creating the most unpredictable outcomes. The question is, is this chain of causality as inescapable as Murakami's storm? And if you can't escape it, then is free will non-existent? And is the world deterministic? And if all that is right, is an ethics even possible in a world like this? A world where metaphorical storms are not just outside us, 
but also inevitably within. For 17th century philosopher Baruch Spinoza, the answer to all those questions is yes. And so he wrote his magnum opus, The Ethics. Here he wrote about how human beings could live a good life, even in a deterministic world. This begins with taking a moment to examine the storms within you. In other words, it is first through an awareness of one's emotions that allows one to be truly free, or blessed, as Spinoza called it. And with that, let's get into it. There are three important concepts in Spinoza's psychology. The conatus, pleasure, and pain. He calls this the three basic emotions. But first, let us talk about the concept of the conatus. According to Spinoza, things can only be destroyed by an external cause. That is, if things of different natures collide. This comes from the definition of essence. An essence of a thing is what makes something what it is. The essence of the chair you may be sitting on is to be a chair. Whether it is a wooden chair, a metal stool, a rocking chair, or a monoblock chair, no matter how it appears, there is something about it. Its essence, or chairness, that allows your mind to understand that, given any of these forms, it is still a chair. And there is nothing in the essence of the chair that tells it to stop being a chair. Its essence won't, all of a sudden, command the chair to turn into a table. And this leads us to Proposition 6 of Book 3 in The Ethics, which states that each thing endeavors to persevere in its being. This endeavor is the essence of a thing. A chair endeavors for the continuing chairness of the chair as a human endeavors for humanness. Now let us take a look at Spinoza's definitions of pleasure and pain. In the ethics, human emotion is defined as the increase or decrease of one's power, specifically the power of the mind and the body. To be more specific, pleasure increases one's power while pain diminishes it. To illustrate, think of basic human needs like food, water, or sleep. We move towards what is pleasurable, like fulfilling our needs, so we can endeavor in our being. And we stay away from pains like possible ailments we could get from being in contact with creatures like roaches and rats. Hence most people's phobias about these creatures. Permutations of these three basic emotions, conatus, pleasure, and pain, result in the various emotions human beings experience. Now, think of a type of vegetable, or maybe the first person that pops into your mind. Do you feel pleasure or pain? If you feel pleasure towards an external cause, such as the image of an old friend, then that is love. Or if you feel pain towards another external cause, such as a vegetable you don't particularly like, then that is called hate. But what about things in the future? Imagine your possible paths after graduation. Do you feel pleasure or pain? If it is the former, Spinoza would call that feeling hope, an inconstant pleasure, relating to something from the future. But if you feel pain, then it is called fear. As you can observe, all these find their basis in the conatus, pleasure and pain. Then Spinoza explains how these emotions and their permutations interact. He discusses about three, association, effects on behavior, and the relational aspect of emotions. Human beings can associate one emotion with another. For instance, why do you react to things in certain ways? Sometimes you can't explain it, but sometimes you could. Think of your favorite song, or your career path, or that one person you don't like for some unknown reason. What do you associate these things with? Maybe your favorite song reminds you of a good time in your life. Or maybe that one person that annoys you for no reason actually reminds you of someone else from the past. Sometimes these associations lead to what Spinoza calls the wavering of the mind. And this is how he explains why we sometimes feel like we have two conflicting emotions for one thing. 
we may associate an exercise routine with aching muscles, exhaustion, and struggle. But at the same time, we may also associate it with the shot of dopamine we feel afterwards causing us to both love and hate exercise. It is during this moment when one's mind wavers that one emotion can potentially displace another emotion. But we'll come back to that in a bit. Second, the emotion's effects on behavior. He says that we want to affect with pleasure what we love and pain to what we hate. Examples would be, for example, kind gestures to for our friends and rude gestures to enemies. Other things Spinoza said humans would do would be to bring into existence what would give us pleasure, like baking a cake, or to make sure that others love whatever we love, like maybe hoping others like that cake we baked. He even says that humans want to make sure that whatever we love also loves us back. Take that as you will. Third, the relational dimension of the emotions. It is here that Spinoza talks about compassion, pity, and benevolence. If someone hates or loves the thing similar to us, then we will hate or love that someone. I suppose an example here is that when we see a fellow human being in danger, then of course we would immediately feel threatened as well. The notion of relating to things similar to us, or our fellow human beings, assists in laying the groundwork for his ethics of desire. But whether you agree with Spinoza's psychology or not, he makes it a point to name emotions and to figure out how they work. How can we be ethical if we don't understand what it means to get there? Think of your bad habits or any negative emotions nagging at you. Can one get rid of these overnight through sheer willpower? Is it sufficient to simply advise someone to get over an emotion? Spinoza would doubt this. Whatever storm is inside you won't simply go away. You can't ignore the storm, neither can you have full control over it. But what then can we do about it? This is how Spinoza's philosophy of the emotions leads to ethical recommendations. And with that, first we must differentiate between the passions and the actions. Think about things you thought through. Maybe you examined how emotionally mature you were before entering a romantic relationship. Or maybe you examined your motivations before you made a decision about your career. Now, think about everything you did on impulse. Maybe you ended up buying something you didn't need or eating more than you could. The former examples were actions and the latter impulsive ones were passions. For humans to be active, they must do things that can be understood as stemming from the nature of the agent. While passivity means you are simply just swayed by your emotions. However, according to Spinoza, we are always subject to passions and free will is an illusion. Simply put, we cannot escape these storms. And this phenomenon, where we find ourselves unable to restrain these emotions, is called human servitude. At first, this may seem bleak. However, it is only after discussing human ver servitude that Spinoza discusses virtue, which is the conatus guided by reason, that will provide a way to have at least a partial control over the passions. To act in accordance with virtue is to be determined by the fact that we understand. We act only in so far as we understand because actions arise from adequate ideas. Now let's illustrate this. Say you are affected by causes A and B. If you are active, although there are still causes A and B, you become cause C. And all three interact with one another to create an event Z. However, if you are passive, Cause C does not exist in this situation. Now, imagine a novelist whose bad habit is procrastination. Say in this case, cause A is that she recently subscribed to a streaming service. The constant notifications distract her from her work. The novelist, if passive, will simply allow this to happen. After all, isn't watching your favorite show pleasurable? something Spinoza said is normal to do for a human being. And Spinoza did say that there was no good or evil in itself. 
For him, what is pleasurable is good, and what is painful is bad. But then, reason comes in, a limiting factor in Spinoza's ethics of desire. It tells her that the novel won't write itself, that in addition to her day job, it helps pay the bills. And it also tells her that there is a deeper cause, cause B, where her cruel perfectionist inner critic prevents her from writing at all. A hidden, unaddressed insecurity. The active novelist, however, would take note of the causes affecting her in order to create cause C for the desired event to take place, writing. What is this cause C? We have said it emerges from within you, but is it pure willpower? Spinoza would say no. Cause C is another emotion. Possibly the realization that the novelist's love of writing displaces her fear of failure. And this is how virtue frees us from human servitude. Because emotions can't be displaced by just willing causes A and B away. Spinoza recommends we meditate on our habits so that the next time the novelist sits on her writing desk, she associates her love of writing with it instead of her fear of failure. For Spinoza, there is one surefire way to free yourself. More than something specific, like the novelist's love for writing. According to him, we must know and love God. He writes, The highest good of the mind is the knowledge of God, and the highest virtue of the mind is to know God. And we have said that the mind is active if it thinks things through and operates on a decent understanding of the situation. But how can we know this? Know God. In Book 1, Spinoza concludes, Deus sive natura, God or nature. But we won't get into the details for this podcast. What you must know is, Spinoza equates God with nature. So the bottom line is, if we understand the world, we understand God. And when we understand the world, we see for ourselves, from the viewpoint of eternity, how causality works. Spinoza says, this knowledge generates love for God. And passivity is generated by loving things subject to change. But activity results from an intellectual love towards a being that is immutable such as God. And this love is the most constant of emotions. And it is never sullied by things like jealousy or envy. This means that love of God is the strongest, purest emotion and can counteract the passions and occupy an even greater part of our minds than them. This is how we become free. And this state of being free is called blessedness. Therefore, it is not through the soul willpower that one becomes ethical. The path to a good life is through navigating with the emotions, to train the mind in such a way that it becomes ethical. By exploring the world, we teach the mind to love God. And this love is what assists in displacing the passions. This is true freedom. And this freedom is not achieved by wrestling with the storms of our emotions. We have to examine it. Give each wind a name. Find ways to convince the winds to flow this way and that. Because again, this storm is you. Something inside of you. But, Murakami adds, so all you can do is give in to it. Step right inside the storm. Closing your eyes and plugging up your ears so the sand doesn't get in. And walk through it, step by step. And with that, let us play a song about confronting and navigating the emotions, just as Spinoza did and recommended in his book, The Ethics. This song is called Here Comes a Thought from the original soundtrack of the hit animated series, Steven Universe, written by Rebecca Sugar. Take a moment to think of just 
Flexibility, love, and trust. Take a moment to think of just flexibility, love, and trust. Here comes a thought that might alarm you. What someone say and how it harmed you. Something you did that felt to be charming. Things that you say are suddenly swarming. And Here comes the thought from the animation Steven Universe, written by Rebecca Sh Sugar. Have you, you know, to, at this portion of our uh, of our show, we'll have the interview on a subject expert, and we have your your. We're very lucky to have a newly minted uh, doctor of philosophy in the person of Lavlin Paklibar, the famous. Mrs. Paklibar, but now known as Dr. Paklibar. So welcome, Dr. Paklibar. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Dr. Julie. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> now, the thing is, you'd mentioned to me that your children uh, watch Steven Universe. Yes, what is, yes. uh, so they, so they, they would know this song, Here Comes the Thought. I think so. I, but they, they sing a different song, but I'm sure they'll be happy if I tell them that, you know. That uh, I've heard this song that's actually philosophical. Oh, so. uh, yeah, here comes the thought. <laughs> okay. Right. So let's uh, get right to the questions uh, prepared for you. Uh, Spinoza criticized ethical theories for emphasizing reason but glossing over the emotions. What do you think of this observation? Is it accurate? What would be the possible consequences of not giving as much attention to the emotions? Yeah. yeah. Yes, I think his, uh, Spinoza's observation is accurate. Um, 
But we need to stress that he was addressing the ethical se- theorists mm-hmm. of his time, uh, which was mainly influenced by his predecessor, René Descartes. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we know uh, of Descartes' dualism of the mind and body, and how he discussed in his The Passions of the Soul that emotions have physical mechanics. Therefore, they are related to the body as a machine. So Descartes argued that passions could be mastered so long as the will is guided by the mind. So Descartes considered the emotions as something that needs to be wrestled with and overpowered. We have to understand that for Descartes, it is important to overcome the passions and emotions for the sake of our freedom. Um, For him, we are free when our will is aligned with clear and distinct perception. In other words, we are most free when our minds are clear and are not stirred by passions and emotions. So we can draw the conclusion that to act ethically for Descartes is to act with the clearness of the mind. Now, Spinoza criticized Descartes and also the Stoics for imagining that we have absolute command of our emotions. Um, Spinoza, by contrast, argues that having feelings does not mean weakness of will. Our feelings are part of nature and follow the same law of necessity in nature as with other things. So since we cannot fully repress them, we might as well try to understand our emotions. So for Spinoza, if we neglect our emotions, the more likely we are to make wrong decisions and actions. He explains this in terms of his concept of adequate causes and inadequate causes, which is related to his concept of adequate knowledge and inadequate knowledge. So when the mind has adequate knowledge, meaning the ideas stem from reason and not mere imagination, then the other ideas that can be derived from it are adequate ideas and not confused ideas. Also, the mind becomes fully the cause of other ideas that it produces and not something external to it. For example, if one studies an issue very well, by researching, reading up, and analyzing facts and data, it would be fair to say that her conclusions come from her reasoning mind and not from the influence of gossip or the opinions of some famous YouTuber or blogger, etc. In that sense, she is fully the cause of her ideas. Now, the tricky part about Spinoza is that he says that emotions are both of the mind and the body. So they are felt both by the mind and the body. So hence, the logic of emotions work the way adequate knowledge works for the mind. If we have adequate knowledge about our emotions and how they work, then we become the active cost of our decisions and actions. So if we are not aware of how our emotions work, then the bodily actions and decisions that they motivate may be caused by things external to us, not by ourselves. So for example, you walk out of the classroom after getting the results of your exam. Okay, so you get okay. a C plus. Aha. Okay, and then a thought lingers in your head. Okay. I'm so stupid, I'm such a failure, I'm afraid that I will not make it this semester, so C plus. Uh, that's a yeah, because of the QPI, useful reaction. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then, so in the next scene, you find yourself plagiarizing a reference for your final paper. Mm-hmm. So for Spinoza, that action is determined by causes that are not in you. They stem from inadequate knowledge, inadequate knowledge about what a C plus means, which your surrounding culture has probably interpreted as failure. Okay? Mm-hmm. So in my interpretation, Spinoza's concept of inadequate knowledge is contained within what neurocognitive science has called today as automatically generated thoughts. Okay, what are our what are our automatically generated thoughts about the C plus? <laughs> <laughs> so di ba sabi nila it's uh, to get um, it means being taken out of the honors program or or these thoughts that we get through socialization through dominant culture social media etc create images in your head and cause your body to have certain emotions like self loathing fear. So those emotions now lead you to do certain actions that for Spinoza, you would not do if your thoughts have been the product of your own rational thinking. 
So I would say that this is close to what the cognitive sciences say now about the relationship of the mind, emotions, and actions. So actions are driven by emotions, and emotions in turn are generated by thoughts. Now this is what Descartes missed in his view of the ethical action or free action. So he did not see that ethical action is driven by positive emotions. Calmness is still an emotion. So it's not really, ethical action is not really an uh, action that is free from the stirring of the emotions. Okay? So as much as an ethical action is also driven by negative emotions. Okay? So hence, rather than make emotions the enemy for Spinoza, he says we must learn to befriend them. All right. Okay. So we must learn to befriend our emotions. Yes. Now, reason is often the source of deciding what is ethical. What can you say about the relationship between emotions and morality? How can emotions inform us about making ethical decisions? Okay. So, like what I said earlier, emotions for Spinoza can inform us okay, on what actions and decisions are ethical. So this is captured in his distinction between a passive emotion or an active emotion. So, so passions or active emotions. I see. So, so you're making that dis he's making that distinction between passions yes. and active emotions. Active emotions, yes. So passions being more passive. Yes, yeah. yes. So passions are the passive emotions, mm -hmm. and those are caused by what Spinoza refers to as imagination. So imagination is an example of inadequate knowledge mm -hmm. because not, it is knowledge that did not stem from our own rational thinking but from things external to us. In other words, mm -hmm. so images. Okay? Imagination is the set of images we associate with certain external occurrences. Okay? For instance, you catch, you catch your friend crying over a piece of chicken joy. And she explains that the chicken joy recalls images of happy times she shared with this guy she just broke up with last week. So she remembers images of the breakup or imagines that she is unlovable or that she has been deserted. Okay? So the emotion your friend feels is a result of images, inadequate ideas of something external to her. Now, what is an active emotion mm -hmm. uh, um, um, on the contrary? So Spinoza says that it is an emotion that arises from adequate ideas. So in other words, ideas that stem from reason. So in this instance, the active emotion would be a certain kind of joy. Okay? Like mm -hmm. maybe your friend would have joy over the fact that she shared memories and created an impact in someone else's life. Or joy over the freshness of a new beginning, right? Joy over being single or something like that. So, so for Spinoza... There's such, so much joy in being single. <laughs> yes. For Spinoza, it is the active emotions that lead us to ethical actions. Mm -hmm. Because they stem from freedom. And freedom mm -hmm. for him is, you know, um, aligning myself to reason. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we are actively the cause of our emotions when they stem from reason and not associated images drawn from external forces. So for Spinoza, what is good is what promotes one's conatus, one's striving. Ultimately, what is good is aligned with God. All right. Okay. So what do you think of virtue? Okay. What is reason's basis for pleasure and pain for doing what is virtuous? I guess this is, this is a question that was started in the Aristotle. Yeah. Uh, so is it really the case that, uh, mm. you know, can, if, if you're doing something that is pleasurable, is that necessarily unvirtuous? Mm. Yeah. Anyway, so, so, yeah. so, so for... Yeah. Um, well, for Spinoza, and, and again, uh, the emotions can inform us mm -hmm. about a uh, virtuous act or virtue. Okay? Virtue is um, related to the emotion of uh, what Lucian mentioned a while ago as the conatus. Okay? So it's related to our power to actualize who we are. So we are all, we all have virtue for Spinoza, but some have more virtue. Some are more virtuous than others. Um, and he describes this in terms of a spectrum of passivity and activity. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the more our minds are acted on by external images, we're away from 
the, the, the extreme end of virtues. So, so he says that the less power we have in actualizing our essence, so mm -hmm. the, the less power we have in our uh, striving in our mm -hmm. conatus. The more our bodies are acted upon by inadequate causes, the more passive emotions we have. Again, the less power we have in actualizing our essence. Now, the reverse applies in that spectrum. So the more um, reason is the source of our ideas, then the more we produce adequate ideas, the more power we have in our striving. And so the more active emotions we have, the more we are driven towards and not away from our flourishing. So it's about activity and passivity. And um, the more we move towards our active flourishing, the more virtuous we are. So reason, in other words, plays an active role in the question of virtue in so far as it provides an important distinction between active and passive emotion. Because passive emotions are emotions that come from inadequate ideas yeah. or images mm -hmm. um, active emotions are those that are um, produced by reason okay that come from us in other words that right. from the but would that would that mean that there's the intention of flourishing or that or is that something that that is already like a, mm. an after effect or it, it comes because you are being rational then the flourishing you become more active or or you intend to to flourish? No, the the, the flourishing is our essence. So so mm -hmm. so it's like we are always striving. Um, yeah, that's to, a to actualize mm -hmm. our our essence, right? So part that's 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 one of the basic uh, uh, emotions that rule us. I see. And the passive and the active emotions either work mm -hmm. for the flourishing, so that's the active emotion. Yes. But the passive work against the against flourishing, them. so it uh. brings you away. From, mm. from flourishing. So when, for instance, you're your passive emotion, um, you are beset by sad thoughts, diba? you become yeah. depressed. Or that when, for example, you become more mindful of what you eat, it is it is pleasurable, but that, yeah. that can still lead to flourishing. Yeah. Yeah. That still leads to flourishing. Yeah. But at the other end of those emotions that, you know, suppress mm. your activity, that, that makes you not want to get up, not want to mm. take a shower, not want to go out there. Yes, it's away yeah. from your flourishing, away yes, from yeah. your All right. So can you further explain, mm. I don't know what this is, intellectual love. <laughs> is this equated with knowledge of God? How does this emerge from contemplating God? Okay. He's so, a Jew, no? He's a Jew. Yeah. See yeah. Spinoza. <laughs> He was a Jew and he was, he was ex excommunicated ah. <laughs> because he did not really <clears throat> subscribe to the idea of organized religion. Yeah, he was like persecuted yeah. as a Jew. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. Uh, because he was, uh, his idea of God, he said, is not something that should be confined within organized religion. Yeah. Um, so anyway, um, so intellectual love, or more completely stated, the intellectual love of God mm -hmm. is love arising from adequate ideas of God. So intellectual lo love of God means knowing and loving all being eternally. Okay, so it is from um, it is from our perspective a difficult thing to grasp, okay? Because we are finite, um, we cannot know everything much more love everything, much more love them eternally. Okay? We know things partially, we know the universe partially, and we only love what we know. So intellectual love of God is love as God's love of all beings. So in some texts, Spinoza says, the love of God toward beings and the mind's intellectual love toward God are one and the same. And this is what we achieve when our mind fully understands God. Okay? I would put understanding in quotes to differentiate it from human understanding or the way we commonly uh, um, understand understanding. So, because the understanding of God that leads to intellectual love is something close to a beatific vision, okay? so, which is not something we achieve through analytical reasoning, but rather through contemplation. So perhaps the, the closest we can associate this with is what we achieve in a deep meditative state. So yung nirvana, siguro ng um, mga Hindu. 
when our mind goes deeper than what is apparent, okay? what is apparent are the things that are changing, impermanent, divided, and we get to grasp more and more what is changeless, what is permanent, what is one. All and right. It's all yeah. So it seems that uh, blessedness is important in uh, Spinoza. Yeah. No? So what is your opinion on Spinoza's concept of blessedness? Mm -hmm. How possible is it to achieve this given human finitude? Mm -hmm. Do you agree that blessedness is strong enough to displace our emotions? Okay. So blessedness is a pure kind of joy, and uh, which is not the same as the emotions, um, because it is an intellectual joy that one achieves through intellectual love. So the intellectual love of God. Okay. So it is the joy that arises with your intuition that we are in God. So maybe that's the, the highest state that you can achieve mm -hmm. um, in your meditation, in your contemplation, um, that kind of uh, blessedness. It is what is captured, I would say, in the prayer of Teresa of Avila, when she says, let nothing disturb you, let nothing frighten you. All things are pa passing. God alone is changeless. Okay? The one who has God lacks nothing. God alone suffices. Now, in this prayer, Teresa says, one who has God. Mm -mm. But blessedness, in Spinoza's sense, would more of mean he who is one with God. So, mm -mm. united with God. And I think that this insight of Spinoza remains relevant today, at least as an enduring aspiration. So, we, it's, it's a very foreign experience, a very foreign concept to us to have this beatific vision to have this uh, blessedness but i i think we point to this reality or to this intuition through our aspirations so we have not yet as a generation completely succumbed to the idea that things are just random and arbitrary somehow there's something still in us that um you know in our personal desires in political life in our nat natural environment that we long for this experience of blessedness all right yeah i wonder if we can play a song of uh mm -hmm. de Avila later yeah, yeah. so what parts of spinoza could be applied to the Spinoza's philosophy of emotions no? that could be applied to daily life. And I think this is our last question. And how would this assist us in living an ethical life? You know, Spinoza um, has regained popularity in the recent um, decade. Yeah. I think it's also because of the rise of all these um, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, a mindfulness movement. Because, yeah, um, uh, one of the things that uh, makes him very relevant is that he was able to, he, he uh, touched on the emotions and he took the emotions seriously. Uh, um, coming from his time, right? I think he's only one of the rare ones who really uh, um, took the emotions seriously. And if we follow him more closely, we can see how much he informs the basic concepts of the neurocognitive sciences and psychology today. So, like I mentioned already, cognitive behavioral therapy has long picked up on the logic of adequate and inadequate ideas and how they affect our emotions and ultimately our behavior. So, one of the things that I think we need to retain from Spinoza is how he maps out how emotions work, that they are caused by thoughts. And he made a distinction between two kinds of thoughts. One of them is the images, so imagination or product of poor reasoning. On the other one is well-digested thought, so, so good reasoning. And so with this knowledge and how emotions work, we can be guided on how to live our everyday lives more ethically. Right. Um, and so one good exercise to make every day is to keep a log of your emotions and to always know this dynamic that, that emotions are caused by thoughts and um, emotions cause our actions. So, so um, whenever we are, you know, confront, we, whenever we are ruled by a certain emotion, it would be good to keep that in check and ask ourselves what thought is causing 
this emotion right now? Mm-hmm. And is this thought, in the language of Spinoza, an adequate thought or an inadequate thought? Mm-hmm. Does this thought make sense or does, is this thought really just pure, you know, uh, um, purely irrational okay so are they unfounded ideas so at least when we are able to identify the thoughts that are causing our emotions then we might be able to change our emotions by changing our thoughts okay? and um, so we create a space between thought emotion and action and when we create that space that could really go a long way yeah it sounds yeah. like a buddhist no? uh, yeah 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 mm-hmm. yeah very much <laughs> all right thank you uh dr lovelin paklibar thank you also you know, for but having me i was gonna ask you since is this is like is this something you would recommend to your boys this loud yes. emotion log yes mm-hmm. Or, well, emotion check and some meditation, yeah. some calming down. Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. Definitely. So thank you again, Dr. Paklibar. I think it's very uh, enlightening. Yes. And, uh, I hope so. <laughs> yes. So uh, for the last part, we'll have the activity. All right. Yeah. Discussed what the emotions were and how they interacted with one another, and we also looked into the image of a storm. Now, most of us would avoid this, but Spinoza would say, understand it in order to learn to navigate through it. With that said, I am suggesting an evening mindfulness activity as a culminating activity for everything that was discussed today. So take out five minutes to do this in a quiet space. Uh, Select a trigger for this. It could be entering your room, removing your shoes, or grasping the doorknob to your room. Anything that would help you integrate it into your routine. So afterwards, get into a seated, comfortable position. And once you do, review your day. Each event that transpired from the moment you woke until the present. And think about how each event made you feel. Notice your thoughts and name them, as Spinoza did. And after naming them, try to ask why you feel this way. What influences you to react this way? Is your mind making any associations between this event and something from the past? Are there any hidden motivations causing you to make certain decisions? How do your emotions interact to create a behavioral outcome. If there is a behavior you wish to correct, how can you best displace your passions with actions? And based on that, how can you apply this the following day? All right, you know, I forgot to mention that Dr. Paklibar finished her PhD at the Catholic Universiteit at Leuven in Belgium. So we're actually, uh, we have the same school. And uh, I, I'm very happy that uh, you, are, you, are a, you are a full-fledged uh, PhD. And I'm sure the university yes. is very proud of you. Thank you very much, Dr. All right, so that's the third episode on the emotions. And I think this really is uh, what, uh, what philosophy is about. Only a, philosoph- a woman philosopher can teach us about the emotions. And uh, it, it only became clear to me exactly on the third, on the third uh, episode. So on the, fourth, on the fourth episode, we'll have Scheller and uh, we'll have Dr. D. All right? So I'll see you next week. And that's before the, oh, that's after uh, All Saints Day. So happy Undas to everybody.
repulsed and empty in my soul Revolted by the blatant lack of God The torture and the pain I can't explain The terror teachers, the terrible oral exams, or the even terrifying but liberating and life-changing aha moments? Lundagin mo, baby! Here's your chance! Lundagin mo, baby! Kasama ang mga pilosopong sina Jovi Miroy at Ron Kapinding. Lundagin mo, baby! Leaping upward, leaping forward. Lundagin mo, baby! Leaping to greater heights, to greater wisdom, to greater magis. Lundag na Ateneo! Radio, Radio Katipunan is now online. See our live feed on facebook.com slash Radio Katipunan. Check out our Instagram and our Twitter at Radio Katipunan and subscribe to our YouTube channel at Radio Katipunan FM for more exclusive content. We are now on YouTube. Watch all of our live episodes plus exclusive content in our channel at Radio Katipunan FM. Don't forget to click subscribe and hit the bell to get the latest updates. Follow at Radio Katipunan in our social media accounts on Facebook, Instagram, and on Twitter. Radio, 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 Katipunan. Kami di mapipigil sa pagpabalit ang tumpa at tama Buhay atin mista, sa loob sa labas ng square